Devashish, I've always been fascinated by the kind of cultural possibilities of what people in the metropolis think of as so-called small towns. But we forget that the small towns had an important role to play in cartographies that have now disappeared. So whether they were railway junction towns or depot towns or towns with aerodromes in the pre-jet age of flying, there was a kind of cosmopolitanism that, that these places had, which we've now forgotten about. So from that point of view, could I draw you out on growing up in Chapra and in Banaras? What were the kinds of histories that you inherited? What was the sense of landscape, of uh, responding to landscape, and how did that play out in your art? Chapra was a very uh, important place historically because uh, the Dutch, the French, the British, uh, the main center that was because of the saltpeter and the indigo thing. But later, I think uh, post independence, it kind of lost it completely. And uh, Bihar, if you see historically also where we were at the time of Ashoka, and I think from there, it, it kind of went back only. And uh, while I was growing up, uh, it was just a small town. And uh, But being in railway, I think uh, a railway kind of keeps you very, uh, uh, you know, protected. And it's very a different kind of environment. It's, it's so not, uh, we were not part of really the city city because uh, railway colonies are huge. Yes. And uh, for the longest time, I think we were till the time we were kind of 12, 13, we were not allowed to go out even. So we were uh, well within the colony would play. So yeah, beautiful landscape, if I talk about, uh, I still remember the kind of rain we used to get and uh, we had a huge window and I used to sit there and uh, it was kind of you know, open a different world and our house was last because railway colony is, is kind of little away from the city. So uh, the, our house was last and beyond that, only the kilometers together was a green uh, field and uh, I think it was very, very beautiful memories I have. But you've also talked about how when you went to Banaras, uh, to, your, to your grandmother's house for the holidays, uh, sitting on the ghat and looking out at the vista of the river and the particular kind of horizon that you have in that context, uh, that gave you a certain sense of scale and light and uh, sort of spatial possibilities. So could you talk a little bit about those experiences? To me, Banaras was my second home because you know we almost exactly like the way you said because my uh, my mother is from Banaras and we used to go every year. At least would spend about two months and during uh, puja, the shera, and during uh, summer vacations. And Ghat, our house was actually on the Ghat, pretty much. Um, it's it, it's Pandey Ghat, Ahila Ghat. It's very close to each other, and so we would every day uh, we would kind of come to Ghat to take bath for sure, and then we'll go up. So, and then I never thought that I'll come to Banaras for studies. And when I came to, uh, uh, to do my fine arts in the year 1990, and I spent four years in a uh, uh, hostel. But since BHU is kind of little away from the main city, but I could never uh, spend, uh, the moment I will finish college, I would come back. Everybody would go to, uh, you know, Marwari Seva Sang for uh, sketching, and people would go to Asi Ghat. But I would come all the way every day, 12 kilometers, to the Ghat to sketch. That was one thing I continued for four years. I came every day to sketch to the Hashemet Ghat. And that time it was beautiful. At that time there was no, uh, this, you know, this so-called uh, Ganga Arati, what is, which is a, yes. which is a, a yeah, and it is a, a really, really, there is no peace actually now at the Ghat. If you sit in the evening, early it was very peaceful. You go, sit there and you, you know, you see this beautiful, uh, you know, they, they would do some, uh, you know, uh, what they call a floating candles, yes. the kids would sell. And would go and just they and they would that pattern would create you know, abstract patterns on the water. Uh, it was like a beautiful canvas. And we would uh, I think uh, the ghat. If you do uh, sit on the ghat steps and if you uh, draw uh, the architecture of Banaras, I think that taught us a lot in terms of perspective because it's very very difficult perspective because the because the angle it is about forty five degrees, so it's very steep. Especially ghats like. Uh, Chetsing Ghat, yeah, Chetsing Ghat one is, is particularly, it's extremely, it is kind of protruding out yes. on the, uh, this thing. But I think Banas was amazing. But Banas, the best part about Banas I always felt is the, 
the mix of modern and uh, and and the old you know it's like uh, banaras kind of its city paused at you know it looks like 18th century uh, 17th century and then you turn and all of a sudden you see this modern coca cola ad so it's a beautiful um, you know blend of two what do i put i think exciting yeah because one of my uh, uh, i have to say was a mentor figure one of uh, uh, my closest friends who's passed away now richard lanoy Uh, he wrote an amazing book on Indian culture called The Speaking Tree, and he was devoted to Banaras. He also lived there. He used to be for a while in the fifties. He was librarian at Rajgarh, the Krishnamurti school. So, reading, talking to him about Banaras and reading his book, I've had this tremendous sense of an urban fabric that, like you said, spans centuries, and um, is very layered and very complex. I find that same kind of layered palimpsest quality to a lot of the work that you do uh including for instance the work that's right behind us here where on the on the face of it it looks like a portrait and uh material seems to be unusual but if you look closely it compresses meters and meters of uh, of cloth of fabric and it's uh it's it, it, the bolts they're unfolding so there's a tremendous sense of of compression in it so is i'm not saying this is conscious in any way but i find in a lot of particularly this work uh there is a tremendous sense of um, hours days weeks centuries of of labor of technique of an attentiveness to material which gets brought together in a very compressed intense powerful way so what was it that brought you to this world of textiles particularly i think textiles uh, number one um, I've, i've been working with textiles for last 25 uh, years um, i worked with a fashion house and uh, textile uh, came naturally to me but in general uh, if i think about textiles i think uh, you know i have lovely memories of because uh, my ma uh, she would uh, uh, wear this beautiful cotton sarees uh, and uh, starched and many times uh, you know i have a very distinct memory of uh, how the textile became part of us in terms of especially uh, i think i did mention once about this uh, you know and we were it was durga durga puja and we were coming from uh, the temple to our home and it started raining and uh, it 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 it's a torrential actually it was massive rain and i started feeling out of breath actually at one point of time there was a huge land in between the railway track and our home and i stopped you know as if i can't breathe so i still remember how ma stood there and uh, you know she kind of tucked me inside her uh, to this thing and and it was she was wet absolutely but you know the kind of warmth it gave me and that feeling of i'm covered and protected right. and that i think textile uh, that a memory is very very distinctly i still remember even um, during uh, uh, you know mahalaya and you know this when this winter would kind of set in and uh, wind our woolens wouldn't be out and ma would kind of simply just pull out a sari of us and just you know, tie us around and it would be a uh, safe you know so those and then uh, uh, even my uh, brother you know he would uh, we had a, a projector at home um, banana smith projector we used to buy, buy from vishwanath gali it's very special you know these two things one was boat if you go to vishwanath gali in banaras you see these two boats uh, running on a water this thing and a projector so we bought a projector and uh, so my mother sarees were converted to a screen <laughs> so and uh, films were projected so i think uh, it kind of it's there we always felt and when i came here and started uh, dealing with textiles and i got into the d- detailing of textiles in terms of i worked with a lot of uh, weaver sectors and we uh, like you know jaipur uh, then i went to gujarat kutch and a lot of uh, odisha i did a complete research with ikat uh, of odisha textile people so i think uh, textile is very exciting and i like the tactile feeling of it and 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 the immense possibility you know it's like you are given uh, two lines yes. this way and that way right. uh, and then you can create anything out of that and the possibility of jacquard i think it, this whole thing it kind of plays uh, in my mind even when i'm doing layout 
I think, you know, I think about how the, this would be woven and then I uh, kind of uh, weaving, printing, all textiles, all the techniques put together and then I come up with my own uh, concept. I think it does help. Have you worked with uh, Jacquard particularly? Because yes, Banaras. Yes, yes, yeah. closely. I have uh, designed, I work with the weavers very closely. So I kind of sit with them, understand their, uh, I sit in their karkhana and I work with the, their Jacquard uh, technique, how they punch in, so how the repeats should be seven and a half inch by seven and a half inch. Right. Yeah, it's very interesting to work with. Yes, I closely work with them. Because it's interesting on the one hand, that's, that image goes back to the Upanishads, the warp and weft, the image of the cosmos. But it's also, I mean, Jacquard particularly is, is a very early form of computing uh, with binary code, with a punch card. So it's interesting how two very different worlds of, you know, kind of mythic, metaphysical imagination and uh, something that's highly technical, they just come together in that act. So how, does, how, do, the, how do you reach out to these different worlds? through your work, because on the one hand there's a strong component of research, of knowing the capacities of materials, and when I look around me at your recent work here, it also involves a great deal of, uh, frankly, physical awareness of what you can do with mater materials, whether it's putty or it's beads or certain kinds of paint or um, what we've been talking about a li little earlier, um, with this work particularly, the honeycomb the spools. So I'm fascinated by the way you, you have that kind of very hands-on awareness, but also the way you reach out to symbolisms. Like when I first saw the work, the red and white work here, it instantly reminded me of the kind of sari that Bengali women wear on auspicious occasions. It's very, yeah, so it's fascinating to see how you work at both these, both these levels. I think this came, uh, I think this must have been in unconscious mind and I don't think it's very conscious effort to, you know, think uh, the way you were looking at it. I think, uh, and I don't plan so much uh, uh, from the beginning. So it's a lot of improvisation also. Like this one, uh, I started this, when I started this one, actually it was like, uh, you know, the, my father was, uh, used to practice homeopathy and uh, so he used to have these uh, glass uh, bottles right. and uh, this reminded me of that and I started putting it together and then how he would kind of keep the whole family till the time he was there, he would, he kept the whole family intact, everybody's right. in touch with him and uh, so this is completely, you know, in this particular work is, is dedicated to him and uh, I see it's this entire uh, growth is kind of unplanned and uh, still has a, uh, a beauty or a planning in it and uh, the this particular Almira which is which is kind of can't hold it complete but still uh, it's it's protected and more like a museum piece very much so you have the idea of the vitrine which should hold an artifact in but the artifact actually exceeds it. It's like a honeycomb. It's, it's got all this sense of cellularity, uh, like a beehive. That's the kind of resonance the work carries for me, certainly. Yes, actually, um, uh, I still have a small piece, uh, which is, uh, which I, I would show you end of the day, that um, that is what inspired me to create. It's, it's actually uh, the yellow bees. And uh, one, piece, one piece they had created there and it fell apart. So mm -hmm. then I kept it for a long time. And then I started uh, uh, building this. But that was in my mind. So I think you connected really well. <laughs> yes, that is, that is what it is. And I'm also thinking we should include the third participant in our particular frame right now. Uh, it's from the minute I walked into your studio, I was startled by how the eyes of this portrait actually follow you around the room, wherever you are, there's a kind of movement. You feel that the, she's you. yeah, she's looking at you. But also it's intriguing how the portrait itself shifts. It's not exactly an anamorphic image, but depending on the angle you're looking at it from, there's a, there's a wonderful disorientation of what otherwise is a, is, is a straight portrait. So like all the old masters, you've clearly there are, there are processes of elongation and foreshortening here, right? So could I draw you out on this? Also the technical problem of, of making a transfer portrait on 
uh, an uneven and irregular surface. So how did you approach that? What are the what are the mysteries of this image? No, I thought when I started thinking is actually uh, once again this uh, since I was one work I was talking about my father one talking about his mother and and whole uh, the concept was about space and the family. So this was certainly in my ancestors that is how I looked at it and the layers uh, you know it talks about it has the history of uh, many generations and if she's the one who's representing uh, one image if I say right. so and certainly because I had I had not seen my grandfather. I always, uh, I, I lost, I think my mother lost him quite early in her life. So I remember I had a very distinct image of my um, uh, Dida, my, what you call my uh, Nani. And uh, so that is where I tried to put, but this particular while making, this if you're asking, it's, it's about, uh, it's quite a tricky one. And uh, this has uh, many layers uh, we created and then uh, we have, kind of uh, woven through each uh, layer which is about uh, 25 to 30 meters of each layer right. and they are kind of uh, embedded in uh, but it was quite a task even for me I didn't realize this is going to be that difficult while uh, when I started planning it actually and it's a developing portrait there's going to be more it is going to be more yeah this. still uh, I'm going to add about a fit I'm also particularly fascinated by by this set of 20, 22, 22. 22 works, partly because uh, the for, I mean the form of the circle is at once very traditional. It reminds you of the mandala. It reminds you of a certain kind of Victorian portrait. Also, you're using a kind of embroidery sampler uh, rim, a frame. So on the one hand, it speaks to all of that, but but uh, but your actual images are based on the fold, the crimp. Uh, it suggests uh, walls or textures. textures. Uh, again, the the beehive. There's all kinds of forms of cycles of different kinds of cycles of growth and decay. This 22 actually, I spent about 22 years in uh, Bihar. So the home which I have lost, if I say so. Right. It's very strange emotion because, you know, railway quarters are um, home of many. Sure. So uh, that home is there, which I called, and I we didn't actually realize that. Uh, and for the longest time, I didn't realize that I'm going to go move out of the city because you know, my I, schooling was there. I was had friends, and a lovely time, a very beautiful life. So when we moved out, and when I moved to Delhi, and uh, it, then it had hit me really hard because the Delhi was a very different kind of city, a cosmopolitan culture, and we grew up in a very uh, small town. And then I went to BHU. BHU was it was kind of you know one notch above, but won't say it's a huge town. But also, it still uh, had a very different kind of life. So this these works are uh, kind of uh, my ode to those uh, twenty two years. So they, hence they are uh, twenty two uh, right. portraits and uh, portraits of time uh, and the textures uh, are typically uh, I remember you know that in our railway quarters they would paint every year and so there'll be layers they won't remove you know nowadays we kind of scrape it completely and then we start a fresh layer no so I would see so then there'll place a pink there'll be a green so somebody who <laughs> lived so you know it's very interesting uh, layering so I think that is where uh, that inspired me. So these uh, shapes, um, actually, if I think now, um, you know, I remember my father used to work for uh, railway, Indian railways, and uh, I used to go to a local shade to see him um, at times. So he, when I would go and look for him, so he would come out of the <coughs> steam engine front portion right. when he would emerge out of this complete this thing, and and uh, there'll be beautiful intricate. Uh, kind of uh, textures and patterns on his face the, the yeah with the carbon thick layer of carbon and uh, I don't remember actually now what I felt that time but it came back to me with uh, I think this kind of uh, uh, you know textures and this thing a layered work but now maybe a little shift from family to your immersion for the first time in an academic context where you studied art and I'm thinking of uh, where you were, the BHU. 
because normally when we talk about pedagogy in in art in India, there's just a constant focus only on uh, maybe Baroda, Shantiniketan, the JJ school. If you're lucky, people talk about Bombay, or about Delhi, the, the College of Art. And sometimes there's a reference to Trivandrum because of the radicals and so on. But I think there are many other centers that don't really get the kind of attention they deserve. So what was it like studying art at the BHU at this moment when you had very interesting people who were either teaching or had come back to teach, where there was a focus on sculpture and on ceramics. And um, you were studying painting, but there was also an openness to these other practices. So could you talk a little bit about that? No, we were lucky that uh, Balbir Singh Kat, uh, he was uh, teaching. He was the uh, he was head of the department of plastic arts, and he became a dean later. So he was uh, amazing. You know, he would uh, not typically how the classes were taken in in uh, art colleges. He you no, know, so he would he, he would kind of advocate. He would talk more about Shantanikan style of teaching. So he would take us out. He would take us to the museum. He would so we'll sit out and talk about art together, not about art but everything else. And you know he would kind of motivate, so uh, we were really lucky to have him as our teacher. And then uh, Madan Lal, he joined uh, the same year when we joined in 1990 uh, as a teacher of plastic art. But uh, and we had um, very we had Banerjee sir for graphics. Um, he he was also a very eminent artist that time. I think we've lost him now. But otherwise. Uh, Typically, if I um, say in day-to-day -day, uh, Banaras uh, college life, other than few teachers, we were not taught. Uh, we were not taught so much about you know think beyond the box. No, we were taught typically academically, and we'll have model studies and the compositions and uh, this thing. But I think much later, I think uh, this shift happened um, when I started uh, interacting with uh, more. Professor than the students, and I, don't, I think Balbir Singh had a big role because okay. I still remember I came to uh, Delhi in the year 1993. I think it was Trinale uh, happened in Ravindra Bhavan. Like the last of the Trinale editions. Yes, so I I came in and then I first time I went to Modern Gallery and still remember the huge piece of germination Balbir Singh cut and that that was kind of pure abstraction and an amazing work and that had about Banaras also. It, you know, it it, it had. A, it's a huge sculpture, and it had a kind of small uh, stone coming out, and it had, and if you would water, it would kind of there, be a, there was a path, right. it would drip through. So it was it really inspired me, uh, though I was doing uh, a painting, but the whole concept of art, I think that uh, changed me. That particular piece of uh, Singh cut, and it really inspired me a great deal. So I think in the entire the way I look at art now, he has a big role to play. Yeah, and the. Idea of the museum has been strong for you, in in uh, in how you approached your work. So, could you talk a little bit about that, particularly the previous exhibition, which dwelt on yeah. the museum as a trope? So, why where did where did that come from? How did that emerge? See, uh, very strange actually, because um, Chapra, very little people know that Chap about thirty kilometers uh, from Chapra, there is a Neolithic uh, site. Called uh, Chirand. Oh yeah, of course. And uh, the mounds. Now, question is that while we were there at 22 years, I was not even aware of it. So when I moved out of this, and when I was, uh, uh, I went to uh, a museum here, uh, National Museum, and I was looking at the Harappa and uh, that thing. Then I started studying about it. Then I read about this particular one, and so I thought, how little we are aware of, and. Then uh, when I, the, the, the entire Indus Valley Exploration, if you talk about, I think only 10 to 15 percent has been actually excavated and still all, you know, lies uh, buried. So, so that is where, this, that, that subject intrigued me and I thought, let me work on this. So if you, if you have seen that those works, those were like 40 by 40 canvases and the, in between the pieces were only by 8 by 8. So that. Uh, that whole empty land was also very metaphorically uh, this thing that that is all uh, this whole thing is undiscovered, undeciphered, or unattended to, un absolutely. Yeah. And how we uh, even treat uh, our heritage. I remember when I came to 1994 here in Delhi and uh, Hotchkar's village, 
in that time was hardly now it is very well protected and looks very beautiful earlier in that time people actually lived there looked like and and it was thick carbon layer they would cook in the monument and the beer bottles and you know they would lie so it was absolutely uh, kind of there was nobody to take care of these things and we talk about heritage in delhi it has so much and india has so, and banaras also you know if you go beyond banaras the city if you go beyond go towards sarnath in between the places you know the on the road you go to the village and you they say they are they are doing a they worship a particular idol and that idol must be 7th century 6th century they don't even know what it is and they put sindoor and that it has become part of their life they think it is their uh, goddess that's but actually that should be part of the right? yeah that should yeah. be part of some museum the rich so i really felt bad how we don't you know look after our heritage and that entire collection and that entire series was kind of i tried uh, talking about this particular thing i'm really intrigued by that because i've over the years become very interested in the stone age and as that i've started to over about a year now i've been doing this column called lost and found histories for open the magazine yeah. so the very first one was actually about the neolithic past and because we're so obsessed with the, the harappan period and the arrival of the aryans you don't actually see that uh, there's a neolithic neolithic culture across south asia and it it spans across uh, the harappan period as well so it's it's intriguing to look back at how we've had very diverse time horizons at the same time but we don't look at these things and like you said many of the neolithic sites are endangered now uh, in kashmir borzahom for instance people are building roads through neolithic sites so I'm even very close from here i think there is one site in haryana very close hisar hisar yeah they did recently even uh, uh, the village here the potter's village bulan shahar they did um, they excavated a little bit and overnight i believe whatever came out the the the, the villages looted <laughs> so that is what i came to know this is about archaeology so yeah i think we just don't know how to do. but i think a bigger role like government has a huge role to play uh, i think uh, in general also in in day to day life you know Parents would also have; they also have certain kind of responsibilities because they take their kids to a malls, but not to the museums. You know, Sunday they would go to a mall, but they should go to a museum because Sunday museums are open. That's true. Yeah. So, but that is, I think, some kind of awareness is required in general in public also. So, how do you how how do you if you ever do do you do you think about a potential audience for your works or who might your imagined unpredictable viewer be no i create i don't see i uh, really it's like uh, uh, if you talk about what we call uh, bihar shakespeare bikari takur so he created you know he created an amazing poet he is amazing performer he was and he was talking he was talking about theater and this and that you know were much ahead of time when nobody was hardly talk nobody was talking in bihar actually and much later i think um, this indian ocean they took one song and he became very popular hilele jagjor duniya something like that is very but so i think you no know, i also i think i create i don't think much about uh, it's uh, heading which way or it's going to be finally getting an audience and no, i think i create and somebody would i think there are takers for everything and and i think there is audience for everything you know, all kind of uh, art form exactly. it's like uh, israj you know it's kind of uh, only what i think with uh, rovindra sangeet i think very few people play now but that's a beautiful instrument but uh, still uh, there are gurus who teach esraj only sure. so i think beautiful things would stay beautiful things will stay is a good way to conclude this particular part of the conversation thank you it's been really a delight yeah